Yes. Okay, uh, so okay. thanks again, David, for this. I really appreciate it. And let's jump into some Alan Havanis and Xavier Monsalvage, which I believe is how it's pronounced. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> okay, so first question. What pieces have you performed for guitar and harp? Uh, just those two, actually, the, the Hovannis and the Montsalvage. Um, I wished I had performed the uh, the uh, Tansman, uh, what do they call the 12? Sweet and Modo Polonico. Yes, yeah, Sweet and Modo Polonico, exactly. Which, in, in fact, I forgot to tell you, um, I just coached it for the first time yesterday. Oh, so wow. the, the sound of harp and guitar is very fresh in my ears. Um, and a very good group is doing it at, at MSM. Um, and that's a beautiful piece, not often done. I mean, I've never heard it done, actually. And I've never seen the music. I've been trying to oh. find it and have not located it. So, oh, my God, this is a conversation we're going to have later. <laughs> OK, yes. All right. All right. That's good. Uh, it's a very beautiful piece. And um, I love the differences between it and the and the solo guitar piece. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's very um, thoughtfully done. I didn't expect that, but it's thoughtfully done okay. uh, for the for the harp and guitar combination. Okay, cool, cool. I believe the original was written for Andrew Segovia. I'm not really sure of the story there. Correct. Well, as far as I know, the story is I, I, I saw briefly the program note yesterday in the coaching, but I need to read it more carefully. Um, the uh, uh, Segovia, I think, yes, I think it was Segovia that, that asked for it rather than Savaleta, but it was Segovia and Savaleta were playing some concerts together and Segovia had requested it. Um, so uh, that that's that's why the piece came into existence. Uh, okay. I think he had already done the the the, um, the, 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 the suite, although I think it had been composed in in pieces, so, so yeah. to speak. Uh, there were first, first the the three easy pieces, trois pièces faciles, and then there was then they sort of he added on to it as it went up, went up, went into uh, you know in time, okay. but um, anyway. So that's the little bit that I know about that piece. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll 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 chat about this. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> okay. So, um, what do you think are the challenges regarding sound or volume with the guitar and harp? Uh, and like very generally speaking, what are some of the challenges? Yes, well, the obvious thing is that the guitar is a soft instrument. Uh, and, you know, even if one's playing a very loud instrument, it's still relative to the harp, a very soft instrument. Ironically, the harp is a soft instrument compared <laughs> to other instruments. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for instance, in that uh, uh, coaching yesterday, uh, when I asked the harpist to play even softer, she said, oh, my God, I, that's, I was playing really softly. <laughs> and then she proceeded to play half the volume and it was stunning. <laughs> okay. yeah. So they're not the harpists are not used to playing as softly as they sometimes need to, to play with the guitar. When, for instance, in this piece, when Tansman writes pianissimo, he really means pianissimo, yeah. and uh, and for a harpist, they are often playing in an orchestra. So the pianissimo in the orchestral context is different than a pianissimo in a context, well, different than in the context of say uh, flute, viola, and harp, a typical combination, and very different from a combination of harp and guitar, yeah. where they have to bring it down a notch further. So the softs for a harp need to be even softer than, than they think usually. Um, the soft of the guitar, the pianos, pianissimos of the guitar have to be at least a notch up, um, yeah. Yeah, right? So pianissimo becomes piano, piano becomes mezzo piano and so on. Um, and so I think in general, 
the guitarist has to play a little louder than they might be used to playing and the harpist needs to play a little softer than they need to play yeah so my yeah, my right. yeah my current chamber coach has mentioned more than once that he he's not a guitarist he's a pianist mm -hmm. and he's mentioned multiple times how guitarists are very um what's the word afraid to play louder than they might be because they don't want to sacrifice tone exactly uh, but exactly. he also went on to mention that besides you know most people don't really have that same ear for tone as us guitarists do um generally speaking so that's all I'll, that's all i can mention about that right now well, that, that is a really really good point i totally agree with that and uh, and part of it comes from the fact that when the guitarist plays, unless it's a certain kind of instrument that has a, a little portal on the upper bout of the guitar yeah. that allows you to hear the sound as it would in front of the sound hole, the guitarist hears the sound differently. They, it's much louder, uh, um, much, it's, it's not the same sound to yeah. the player as it is to the listener. It's different in many different ways. So when they think they're playing loud, they're usually not playing loud enough, <laughs> yeah. right? And so, but the other part of it is that this very issue of tone, they hear all the, the guitarist hears all the nuance of the tone, the little finger scrapes and nail clicks and so on, uh, which might get picked on a microphone for a recording, but don't get picked up at all in a concert setting where yeah. your first row is probably, you know, many feet away from you. So the guitarist is hyper aware of those extraneous sounds, which bug them, but it's not going to bug anybody else yeah. in the audience because they're not even hearing those little clicks and noises, right? So no. guitarists tend to be very um, uh, narrow in their, yeah. in their sort of... Um, wrapped up. Yeah, wrapped up, kind of insular about, yeah. about the way they, they, they make a sound in the, in the, in the world. And it's, it's like your, your coach says, it doesn't make that much difference to most yeah. listeners, you know? No. <laughs> so, yeah. So those are, I think, some of the reasons why he said what he said. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So now, so we already sort of discussed this, um, and that is, what are some of the weaknesses of the guitar? Oh, so, my apologies. We just reviewed this, didn't we, basically? Oh, no, no. This is the next question, but we've kind of covered mostly what, what goes into that question. So I think we're okay on the next one. Yeah, okay. So now, to what extent do you think the composer, in this case, specifically, I want to refer to Alan Havanis in Spirit of Trees, hmm. use dynamics to reinforce a better balance between the two instruments? Hmm. Um, Havanis, first of all, was the kind of composer who did not feel that he wanted to, how shall I put this? He didn't feel like he wanted to impose the composer's will uh, in terms of dynamics on okay. the performer. And there are usually two kinds of composers in this regard. One is the kind who is very, very detailed uh, in their, approach to, to notating dynamics, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Carter or Boulez or Fernie Ho, you know, okay. those kind of people, they, they're very, very meticulous in their um, approach to, to dynamics. They, they want every nuance to be notated. And then there's another kind of composer, of which Havana is, is one type, and Villalobos, for example, is another, and many, many other composers like that, who use dynamics as a kind of a, uh, an armature or, a, you know, a, a structure um, 
on which to hang the music or on which the music hangs actually <laughs> so um um so they don't uh, Hovanis in particular doesn't write very much crescendo decrescendo mm -hmm. and he doesn't really write even that many dynamics in fact some movements are without dynamics i noticed this morning when i looked at the score the um the fugue uh let's see the fugue the fugue's in the third movement yes the fugue has no dynamic in it nothing nada not a thing uh which is bizarre so what what was he thinking i don't know i mean i think he's he's thinking uh i'll leave it up to the performers completely i mean he's not he, clearly he's not giving any idea about relative dynamic between the two instruments mm -hmm. yeah Al although the obvious thing here with a fugue is that the voices are equal so the two voices i guess that are in the harp part uh, are balanced with the one voice of the guitar. So it's a three voice fugue, two of them being in the harp. And so you have to adjust dynamically accordingly. And that's totally up to the performers. And that's what Hovannis wanted. He wanted, the, he didn't want to dictate uh, something, partly because sometimes in the dictation, the meaning gets lost. Mm -hmm. um, so he, rather wanted to show uh, the, the the overall the gestalt uh, of the of the piece and let the performers fill in because Hovannis's music is very natural it unfolds naturally yeah. and he doesn't want anything to be unnatural so it's almost as if he's saying well the gestures here are common sense it's what you would expect that's so how I felt right I felt. so exactly so you you use your instinct you know you use your instinct so um the other thing uh that you can say i think about hovannis's uh dynamic markings and i think the same is true of montsavage's uh markings as well is that they tend to write dynamics as far as i can tell they tend to write dynamics of how it should sound not how the player should think about playing. In other words, it, it's kind of what I was talking about before. If a guitarist needs to produce a, a mezzo piano dynamic, uh, they're going to have to uh, adjust uh, mezzo forte, right? Uh, if they're going to play fort forte, they've got to play fortissimo, depending on the on the context, right? Okay. Uh, so. Some composers, um, myself included, sometimes <laughs> I'm I'm inconsistent on this actually, um, but some composers uh, write those kind of dynamics, and others write the dynamics as it should sound ultimately, and then they leave it up to the performer to decide how to achieve that. So okay. in this case, with the tricky dynamic balance between guitar and harp, uh, Hovannis has completely left it up to us because when he writes uh, a passage where the, clearly the two uh, have equal importance and he writes piano for both or mezzo forte for both, you have to translate. Yeah to how much sound do I need to make on the guitar or how little sound do I need to make on the harp in order to get that desired effect. Yeah, well, and that's different for every single interpreter. Interpreter, yeah. Yes, exactly. Which I think both Hovannes and Monsovaj would say that's how it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that. Yeah. Next question. Um, this one is particularly interesting because I've, and I know you have probably thought about this. Do you think the tempo markings in Spirit of Trees are well suited for the duo, the combination? Yeah, I do. Definitely. The only one, uh, that I thought was, uh, seemed uh, kind of off was the metronome marking and the fugue, in fact. 
Uh, yeah, 144. Yeah, seems really slow to me. Okay. I mean, he, he marks it allegro. Um, and I don't know what's 144. It's uh, -da 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 -dum -ding -dum I don't know. It seems really slow for allegro. Yeah. Uh, and I when I recorded it, I recorded it quite a bit faster, I think. Yeah. Which you know, which better. which leads me to ask a question that I completely forgot to write down was mm -hmm. um what was the first recording of Spirit of Trees? Do you know by chance who recorded it? <laughs> who made the world premiere recording? <laughs> me, myself <laughs> and I and Yolanda Condinasis. <laughs> Wonderful harpist. Thanks for yes. asking. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we we did the first recording. Uh, it was a it was a great honor uh, to premiere that piece on recording. Uh, it's kind of amazing that uh, Sabaleta and Yepes never made a recording of it. I I don't know yeah. what the story is on that. Um, but uh, yes, so it was us, and uh, uh, we we had a great time doing it. But uh, back to your question about um, yes. <laughs> uh, metronome markings. Uh, otherwise, you know, he tends to write circa next to his metronome markings. Yes. And um, again, that's the component. Yeah, they're all circa. They're all circa, every single one. Wow. So um, yeah, every single one is circa. So again, he's he's the kind of composer who says, look, okay, this is what I think it should be. But if you feel it should be a little slow, <laughs> a little faster, fine by me. You know, do what works for you. Hovhannis is that kind of a composer, uh, which is very wise. I, I think it's uh -huh. very wise. I mean, it's very good to have a metronome marking that kind of centers us and tells us at least approximately where he intends it to be. But then if we feel it differently, either because we're wired differently or because we have a, a interpretive sense that's, that changes changes the speed a little bit, by all means, says Havanas, go for it. No. Yeah. Well, thank you to Havanas. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> okay, so next question. So this one is a little more complicated. Okay. What are some of the interpretational or compositional differences between the pieces by Alan Havanis and Xavier Monsalvage? Mm, yeah, That's a big is, question. A big question. Um, well, I guess, first of all, to state probably the obvious, uh, Hovhannis's language is very simple uh, uh, harmonically, um, a very simple language. It relies on its modal modal language, uh, which Hovhannis was very fond of. Um, speaks, of course, to his Armenian roots, um, less to his Scottish roots. <laughs> uh, but uh, the Armenian roots are the ones that get expressed in his music more often anyway. Um, and uh, Monsauvage is um, a more a freely tonal kind of piece that, um, you know, I do, I do, I do, I would call it freely tonal. It's, it's definitely not atonal. Yeah. Um, but it's a more complex language. Um, and um, another sort of general difference is that uh, Hovhannis's music is very much um, spiritual, deeply, deeply spiritual music. Yeah. Uh, Monsalvage's music is very much of the earth. Okay. It's earthy. It's it's uh, it's human. It's um, it's you know like the last movement, the Brasiliado, is you know while it's a kind of a, a in a way a cerebral take on it. It has folk roots in it and. Um, it's 
you know, it's it's more of the people kind of thing than of the of the air and the and the no. ethos. Yeah. And the spirit. Uh, um, one thing that I do when you mention the Brasilado, the last yeah. movement of the Fantasia, yeah. um, it's just a very fun piece to play. Uh, yeah. It's very, I know it feels sort of natural. It feels it's the most. It's one of the most. I don't know. It comes sort of sort of to guitarists much more easier than say the first movement, which is much more free and a little bit more. I don't know how to describe it. Just like the, you say, the language is a lot more uh, complex coming from the Spirit of Trees by Havanas. Yes, yeah, they're they're really night and day. Oh. I mean, and I would, yes, those are great. I love those comments. And um, I would say also, you know, that the, that the Mont Sauvage is, is definitely more cerebral, um, it's not uh, cerebral to the extent of uh, Carter and Boulez, yeah. <laughs> as I mentioned yeah. before. It's not that. I would agree perfect. there. <laughs> right. But it, but it is um, uh, much, it's a much drier piece than the Havanas, which, which is emotionally very wet <laughs> to okay. me, if that okay. makes sense. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it has, the Mont Sauvage has a kind of a, a reserve to it uh, okay. that um, uh, it it it's not and it's not boring by any means a very exciting piece wow. um, but it's it's reserved it's drier um, and it's the kind of piece that says okay we got this let's move on now <laughs> <laughs> whereas Havana's kind of dwells in it for a long time really yeah dwells. yeah is almost minimalist in a way and it's some passages are very minimalist that's that's a, that's how i would describe in the in the havana is the first and fifth movement mostly because they're very just um i don't know establishing more of um an energy for the piece you yes know, the beginning energy and the closing energy to the piece exactly they're they're atmospheric yes yeah. Okay. Yeah. The atmosphere. Yeah, and and Mont Sauvage is less about atmosphere and more about you know the the dynamic interplay between voices and rhythms and harmonies. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a very lively, um, animated, um, uh, active piece. It, okay. it moves. It moves a lot. Havana's just kind of sits there in its peace and calm and you either go with it or you don't. <laughs> Some people have less patience with people like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, small tidbit, I, I played in a concert one time years ago in upstate New York mm. and a lady came up to me afterwards and it was such a beautiful piece, the piece by Havanas, but it really put me to sleep, but in the best way possible. <laughs> 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 oh man, <laughs> that's very funny. <laughs> Lovely. Oh man. So, uh, and let's see what else. Um, yeah, I think with the Mont Sauvage, because it is such an active piece, um, every moment or or group of moments needs to be. It needs to be made to come alive. The, the Havana's piece, if you set the atmosphere and play with beautiful tone with both instruments, and you just kind of let the music happen, it almost plays itself, almost. I mean, it does, like the pieces like the fugue and the canon need a little more shaping because they're more, um, you know, they're more Bach-like. They're mm -hmm. you you have to do a little bit more with it. But even those, if you just kind of let it be and don't do too much to it, it 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 plays it almost plays itself. Yeah. The Mont Sauvage doesn't play itself. You have to kind of coax it out. And there's lots of of material to coax from. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a lot of material that, you know, the gestures that uh, 
may happen for a moment and then lead to another thing. And that thing then dwells for a little bit, but then leads to a new thing. And it's always, every, every one of those moments needs to be enlivened in the most vivid way possible, interpretively. Yeah. Uh, and then it becomes one vivid moment going to the next, going to the next. I, so, I, I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure if you feel this way, but I felt like it was much more difficult to interpret the Monsavage than the Havanas. Because like you said, yeah. the Havanas very much just sort of plays itself almost in a way. Exactly right. And the, the concerns you have with the Havanas, <clears throat> excuse me, are, you know, are we um, meeting the beat together as two plucked instruments? You know, <laughs> how's our uh, dynamic balance? Uh, how's our sound? How's the overall feeling? Those kinds of things, you're working so hard on that to maintain that. With the Mont Sauvage, those things are less meaningful. And with that piece, you really got to work harder to, to make it go. Not that it's beautifully mm. written, beautifully composed piece, but it's the kind of thing where every gesture needs to, needs to be illuminated. And yeah. you, 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 whatever you do to illuminate, whether it's exaggerate uh, uh, dynamic uh, issues or you, you uh, feel the harmonies more uh, intensely and intuitively, um, or you make gestures very bold. There are a lot of bold things in both instruments that yeah. happen. And you want to really make it bold to the hilt so that <laughs> as bold as it can be. And then the piece becomes very exciting when you have yeah. that extreme uh, uh, contrast, extremity of, yeah. of, of expression of con with contrast, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, we really, I'm glad we see very much eye to eye on this. <laughs> we, do, we do, no surprise there. <laughs> it's almost as if I spent many years, you know, learning with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man. Okay, uh, next question. Let's see here. Um, Oh, this is a fun one. Did you ever meet Alan Havanis or Xavier Monsalvage? And did you work on any of these pieces with them? Um, so, uh, no, I didn't work on either either piece with a composer. I never met Monsalvage. Uh, I don't know if he ever came to the US, frankly. I, I True, don't, I, I don't know uh, either. And I, I didn't uh, spend very much time at all in Spain, unfortunately. Um, Hovannis, I did meet. I only met him once that I remember, although it seems maybe I met him more than that once. No, I think I only met him once. Um, and unfortunately, it was at, toward the end of his life. I knew, see, I've, I have a pretty close connection to Hovannis because uh, my husband, Ralph, uh, was the head of classical music at BMI and had a very close relationship with both Alan and Hinako, his wife. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew a lot about them and particularly about Alan as a person and um, his career through Ralph. Um, and uh, so in, in many ways, by the time I met him, I felt like I knew him already. Yeah. Uh, we did have some correspondence at some point, and I think it was about um, I think it was about solo pieces. I had been looking at some of his solo pieces, and it. I think I had asked him about concertos that he had written. While, yeah, which, you... well, which I finally recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the only time that I met him, unfortunately, was really at the end of his life when he was losing it. Um, he, um, his, his mind was going, he became very, very quiet. Um, I think he was always a pretty quiet person in general, but he became really quiet. <laughs> <laughs> he barely said anything. We went out to dinner, uh, the four of us. Um, and um, 
was basically a, a conversation between Hinako and Ralph and myself. Uh, uh, Hovannis was there, but barely. He just didn't communicate much at that point. Okay. Um, so I can't say that I got a whole lot from that meeting, unfortunately. But I have listened to so much of his music and uh, know so much via Ralph about uh, his work and his career that I, I feel like I knew him. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of strange. And I think for me, he's also a bit of a kindred spirit in terms of the spiritual connection to things. Um, he was probably more deeply spiritual than I am, but, uh, but I do share that kind of connection with him. So that, that's my limited experience with the man. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's yeah. awesome to hear. Um, I mean, it's, it's a shame, but again, when you know, when you know the music so well, like I'm sure many of us can say, we know the music of Bach, for example, it's like, we all know a little, our own version of Bach, most likely after, you know, so much time that's spent right. with the music of, you know, someone like that. That's true. All right. So next one. Um, okay. Here is one that is, I think, excellent, but also difficult. Were there any compositional tools that either Havanas or Monsalvaja utilize to achieve a good balance between the guitar and harp? Um, I know it's difficult to say like a specific compositional tool, um, but it's- A compositional tool, what do you mean? What kinds like, of- um, For example, see, I, I kept thinking of this and it was, I my thinking was along the lines of, um, I'm gonna write the harp part like this because the guitar part is going to be not as strong as the harp or basically something like this. Um, mm -hmm. Because the, the guitar, has a limited sort of you know range and volume maybe a composer might think okay i'll you know thin out the the harmony in the harp part to allow the, the guitar part to to shine a bit more so that people can hear it whereas if the harp were in a, an orchestral piece you know by wc or something it can be much more richer much more full in yes. their sound and sort of the range Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, those kinds of things were happening all over the place, and in, particularly in Monsalvage's piece. I think Hovannis probably was less concerned about that because he didn't think as much about those kinds of details, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quite sure that Monsalvage did. Um, I'm just looking now at a passage uh, at Rehearsal 14 in the first movement of the Mont Sauvage, towards the, right towards the end, where there's glissando in the in the harp, and there's uh, a tremolando chords, uh, loud chords in the guitar, um, and it's interesting. They both have a crescendo from I guess it's. Piano. Here's another place where there's a kind of a dynamic missing, uh, at least in the guitar part. But um, I imagine that it's kind of pianoish at 14, and then there's crescendo marked in both parts. So they crescendo together, and that um, that's kind of perfect. That Monsavage ma matched the glissando of the harp, which can be very very soft or excuse me, or very, very loud. Yeah. Uh, and the guitar, it, you know, there's only so soft you can play six note chords uh, yeah. with tremolando, you know, or, or raschiato effect. Uh, so uh, and that was an interesting choice um, on his part. And um, I mean, otherwise there, there's, um, you know, there's sort of the, the common thing of uh, 
call and answer, so to speak, where one instrument plays and then the other plays. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking of. Uh, one of the things that I, through analyzing the piece, I noticed that a lot of the time um, there is a meeting of the guitar and harp in the pieces, but there's a lot of here's the guitar part doing its thing, here's the harp part doing its thing. That's um, right. And I that's always right. felt that that was... I, I expected it to be a thought of the composers uh, because they probably knew if the guitar and harp are playing together all the time, it's going to be a beautiful harp piece. That's um, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Which I think is more what Havana's had in mind uh, for the beautiful harp piece or the big guitar piece, <laughs> whatever, yeah. whichever way you look at it. Um, although he also uses that technique, as you know. Um, but then the other thing is, um, again, a sort of a typical composer technique is to have, uh, say, the harp playing quarter note chords. I'm looking here at rehearsal five and um, what movement was this? I think it's the second movement. You know, it's the last, the last movement. Uh, around rehearsal five, a little after rehearsal five, he's got quarter note chords on the harp while the guitar is playing 16th notes. Okay. Um, and so uh, when you've got the more powerful instrument playing the more spaced out chords, as it were, um, with sound dying in between, of course, uh, with the guitar being the more active part, that's a kind of a natural way to do things. And then he does the same thing at rehearsal seven at Pumoso. Uh, he's got uh, dotted quarters in the harp. They're just kind of keeping time while the guitar is playing eighth notes. Um, so that in that context, again, the guitar comes out more, it emerges more from the, from the texture. Um, Yeah, and then I think, you know, again, with the Hovannis, it's more just really like one big instrument. Yeah. But he does use that back and forth technique. It's interesting, in the concerto, or the first concerto, uh, he uses that a lot, to, to where the guitar plays something and then the orchestra plays something, guitar and then orchestra, and instead of a blend, um, which is a very simplistic way of dealing with yeah. the bigger uh, problem yeah. of guitar playing with orchestra, but um, but it works and it's, it's a great piece. Um, <laughs> but in this piece, he ventures more towards um, playing together. And then he does, um, you know, in both the fugue and the canon, uh, have the gall <laughs> <laughs> to, to put two voices in the harp and one voice in the guitar um, and they're basically playing more or less equal values I mean I'm looking at the canon for a moment uh, playing eighth notes and sixteenth notes together and in the fugue uh, it's the same idea eighths and sixteenths and they're playing them together pretty much so they're equal um, and he didn't do anything fancy compositionally mm -hmm. to make up for this. Um, and I think it's because Hovannis didn't really think much about these issues. I really don't think he was that kind of writer. Um, so somebody, for instance, like Benjamin Britten would have been far more careful about something like that and really thought very carefully about what kind of textures in each instrument would combine well with the others in terms of balance issues. Um, Britain was that kind of meticulous composer, mm -hmm. not nearly as much so as the composers I mentioned earlier, somewhere in the middle, uh, but Hovannis is way over on the other end of the spectrum. Oh, well, that's, that's 
a great thing for anyone playing his music, especially for guitarists. <laughs> yeah. Just just do what you want. Just yeah, right. <laughs> make it sound good. <laughs> it may be too trusting of guitarists. You shouldn't trust <laughs> guitarists that much. <laughs> Should never trust a guitarist. <laughs> really, really, I know. <laughs> you wouldn't want to meet a guitarist in the dark alley. <laughs> oh man. Okay. All right. So next question. Uh, this is we've we've mentioned this briefly before. Uh, so I just want to touch up on it. Is do you know what motivated Havanis to write the sonata for guitar and harp? Oh yeah, it's a simple thing. As Zabaleta uh, asked him for the piece, I, I imagine it was a money commission. Um, he and and the Narciso Yepes were going to play some concerts together, including a concert at Carnegie Hall, uh, which is ultimately where they did the world premiere, as you know, of both pieces, uh, the yeah. poems and the Mont Salvage. And uh, so, <laughs> excuse me, I think, um, uh, Zabaleta had in mind the, the, the contrast of these two composers. Yeah. He commissioned these pieces. Uh, I, I'm, get, I'm actually, I don't know with the Mont Sauvage, I, I'm guessing he commissioned them. Did, did he? I, I, I think so. I, I'm, I'm still trying to chase down concrete information on this. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that for a fact that um, Sabaleta commissioned uh, Havanas, and uh, the cool thing is, the last time we talked, you had mentioned yeah. maybe Sabaleta knew Havanas from before, hmm. and the answer is yes. Uh, Havanas wrote a piece for Sabaleta in the 1950s. Um, ah. I, I think the date I saw was 1954. Interesting. Uh, piece for Harp. And so I'm sure they'd known each other for the years, and I have zero doubts that Zabaleta thought of him of writing a piece for guitar and harp. Do you remember the date of the Carnegie Hall premiere? Wasn't it in the late 90s? I think it was 1984. I have the program here, if you give me one second. Yeah, thank you. I'm curious, because I... I see in the score that the copyright date is 1990, but it doesn't tell us the composition date. Okay, so I have it right here. So the concert premiere was in April of 1984. Ah, okay. And this was the first New York performance. And... Oh, is, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a, new, a world premiere of the Mont Sauvage? I just no, no, this is the Havanas. Oh, the Havanas. The Havanas. Even, says, even, the, even the Havanas, was it? Uh, I thought it was a world premiere in Carnegie. No? It's, it says in this program, it says first New York performance. Ah, so they premiered it elsewhere. Interesting. It probably. And let's see. And Europe. he also writes uh, the Sonata for Harp and Guitar. So this is Havanas himself. He wrote some notes. Mm -hmm. He wrote. Um, the Sonata for Harp and Guitar was completed on March 15th, 1983. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but the Mont Sauvage, I don't know when it was written. Um, that I don't know. It does not say in the music. It doesn't say at the end of the score. It doesn't say it at the beginning. And there's no note with the piece. And there's no commissioning dedication. So it, who knows? I don't know. I, I, I'll be interested if you find out uh, how that piece came about. Yeah, it doesn't, um, it was, it seems to have definitely been a collaboration between um, the three, Yepes, Sabaleta, and Mont mm. um, because he had written a concerto um, the Concerto Capriccio for harp um, for, for Sabaleta and a con Metamorphosis Concerto for guitar for Yepes. Ah. So, and those pieces are 1975 and 1982. So, oh, interesting. Jeez, who have, 
Who, who knew about the Mont Sauvage Concerto? Uh, nobody plays that piece. I wonder what it's like. I've, I've, I've seen uh, recordings. I've seen album covers for the Metamorphosis Concerto, but I haven't heard it yet. Um, oh, I'm going to, we'll, I'll give that a look. I'll give that a look. Yeah, I'll be interested to hear that. Um, so, yeah, and I do, I do know, at least according to Hinako's version, um, that uh, Hovannis and um, uh, Yepes, no, let's see, Hovannis and Yepes did, did not meet until that uh, the night of the premiere, premiere in New York. And okay. They went out to dinner. There's, a, there's an account of it in some program liner notes from, I think, when the second guitar concerto, it's in those liner notes. Okay. Uh, yeah. There's a little account of it in there, um, and she she says that uh, you know they had met for the first time there. Well, I'm glad they met at some point, for especially when they premiered the piece or yeah. in the New York yeah. performance. <laughs> All righty, okay. So now, thanks once again. We've arrived at the last question. Yeah. Does the repertoire for guitar and harp hold any importance in the guitar world? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny question because uh, uh, it damn well should. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, um, both pieces are very significant contributions to the guitar chamber music repertoire. Extremely wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> yeah, um, there's just no question. They're they're very important. They're they're significant in length. They're substantial, you know, as pieces. Uh, very important composers uh, writing for the guitar. I think when any any important composer writes for the guitar, it's something that the guitar world should take note of. Yeah. Um, we we don't have a huge repertoire. We're not like lucky pianists or <laughs> the cellists, you know, who have this enormous amount of repertoire to choose from. So when we do have composers of the stature of Montsauvage and, and uh, Hovannis, um, it's definitely important to sit up and take note, uh, especially because we didn't have any of the great composers before the 20th century, right, for the guitar. Yeah. Uh, except, you know, like a little dabbling by Schubert and, you know, a, a possible mandolin piece by Beethoven and, and Mozart here and there, you know, those yeah. kinds of things. But uh, other than that, uh, those guys didn't write for the guitar. So all the great music, the greatest music written for the guitar has been since the early 20th century until now. And... Um, and if there is important guitar and harp repertoire, as I think there is, at the very least, these, these two pieces and the Tansman piece, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there are other pieces I'm less aware of, um, uh, I think it's very important um, for guitarists to, to notice it. Yeah. Guitarists in general don't pay enough attention to chamber music uh as you know i feel and uh, <laughs> i i think um it's a really important part of our our legacy is is that chamber music that includes the yeah guitar. um one thing that i will mention is uh, more than one coach i've had for guitar and harp repertoire has said oh gee i've never heard that before and here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> oh, but, and it's just, I mean, on the one hand, I, I can understand because, I mean, how often does a guitarist meet a harpist today and go, mm -hmm. hey, let's play some music together? That's. But not, you know, yeah. but they're, they're both instruments that, that, yeah. that are always looking for more opportunities, you know, for repertoire, for performances. So, it, it really, it, it should not be the way you describe yeah. it. No, it is, but it shouldn't be, you know. Yeah. It, it's, um, yeah, guitarists also tend to be very 
um, insular in their choices of, of music. They tend to play things that other people have played a lot. So then the, the same pieces get played over and over again. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even, even myself as composer, I've experienced that. I wrote this piece very early in my life, 40 years ago, called Dances in the Madhouse. And <laughs> Many people think of it as the only piece I ever wrote. <laughs> My God, it's like just because everybody plays it. I mean, I'm grateful that a lot of people play it. It's great, but I've written so much other music since then. Why don't they venture forth? That's just a personal note. But I mean, I can say the same thing about, look, the Mont Sauvage Concerto yeah. is another example. There's a piece by a major composer. It's, uh, there, there is a concerto for guitar. Well, how come people aren't playing it? Yeah. Or there's a piece by Ohana, Tres Graficos, this very fine yeah. piece. Why aren't people playing that? There's a Jean Francais concerto for guitar and strings. Fabulous piece. Why aren't people playing these yeah. things? Well, because, you know, their their friend hasn't played it or their favorite guitarist hasn't played it or whatever. I mean, guitarists need to be much more... Uh, um, Open, resourceful, and and inquisitive, and curious about about repertoire, and go investigate like you're investigating. Yeah. Go investigate uh, the, the <laughs> vast corners of the repertoire because there's a lot of music by well-known composers like this that remain underplayed. Yeah, it, it astonishes me. It never ceases to astonish. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two quick things to mention, mm. and the first is. So far in my career, the only David Leisner piece I have played is Dances in the Madhouse. <laughs> oh no, guilty as charged. <laughs> but you had mentioned to me some time ago about four preludes for guitar, a, a set that I've, I've been meaning. I have the music. I just <laughs> haven't gotten around to playing it in a concert yet. Oh, um, thank you. That's so, nice. And then the second thing is... Um, Oh man, I, I already forgot. Um, what did you say? Oh, I'm blanking right now. <laughs> well, I mean, so it's all right. So while you're thinking about it, I mean, another example of that is, you know, in my, again, in my particular case, uh, I've written some decent solo pieces, but really my, I think my more important contributions so far have been chamber music with guitar and with other instruments. Um, and guitarists tend to go for the solo pieces. Yeah. And, you know, again, it's kind of this little insular world. And I, I, one of the reasons why I wrote so much chamber music with guitar is because I kind of figured that the guitar world would expand uh, over time and there would be more guitars playing more chamber music, you know, in 20 years after I wrote it. Well, 20, 30, 40 years after I wrote it, it's almost the same. I mean, it, the needle has moved a little bit, but only yeah. a little bit, you know. So I wish yeah. I wish the guitarists would would be more excited about exploring, you know, and curious about exploring. But anyway, well, that's, that's okay. another topic, really. <laughs> I, I remembered, and it kind of Good. ties in a little bit, um, is that the reason I picked guitar and harp was I actually remember the first time I heard it, was um i can't say his full name uh because it's too complicated but it's an icelandic name his name is Guli. i heard Guli play the sonata for harp and guitar with the harpist in mikowski hall at oh msm yeah. and that was the first time i had ever heard it and i was like man that sounds so great i want to do that too <laughs> and then I had fought, so that it's exactly that I had heard you know Ghoulie play it and then I wanted to play it but Perfect. then I went a little bit further and I found some other repertoire like the Mont Salvage and I played that no. and then uh Dr. Noon uh David Noon composer he uh wrote me a duo for guitar and harp that I'm in the process of playing right now as well oh that's and, so exciting yeah, and uh, I I played it in New York uh, a couple of years ago because he wrote it in oh man like 2016 I believe, mm -hmm. and so now I'm in the process of trying to get it on video and some audio or something like that, and Perfect. just slowly I keep talking to composers and trying to expand a little bit also because there's not that much written for the instrument and 
even right. these composers have I've I heard from one uh, in particular that told me oh I'd never thought about that Oof. it's a perfect match like... oh yeah it is a perfect match but I'll tell you the harp is really hard to write for yeah <laughs> It's I've very, heard, I've heard. <laughs> it's very hard to write for. Yeah, the pedals especially make it make it really hard. So a composer really has to know what they're doing with the harp. Yeah. It's not easy. Uh, Monsovage was quite masterful in this harp writing, I think. Uh, he really, yeah. He knew the I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the harp players that I've played with have all told me, the, one of the first things they've always mentioned to me is like, are the pedalings in the piece? Because apparently that's not super common to have the pedals written in because that, oh. uh, yeah, people forget. People just oh don't God. know. They just write the oh the, no. the music and then have at it. Bye. Oh, no. That's <laughs> terrible. No, that's bad composing. <laughs> that's oh. abdicating your composer responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, say thank you one more time and then end this recording here. Uh, so thanks so much for doing this. We're gonna stay on just a second longer, but I'm gonna end the recording here. All right. Um, bye bye to anyone listening out there. And um, <laughs> you will get a transcript of this soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks, um, let's see here.